Good evening. It's the inaugural episode of What You Idiots Just Missed. We'll work on the title later. Unfortunately, we must start this episode off with some mild tragedy. Late last week, was a very important member of the tech community. It hit Apple rather hard. He's been a member for so long, but Jack, this one's for you. But on to more upbeat news. Uh, apparently this past weekend, we had free porn day. Over a hundred porn sites granted absolute access to their users. Our colleague Walter Horowitz was supposed to do the report on this, but unfortunately this morning he called in about a medical issue. He was suffering from shortness of breath, extreme exhaustion and cramping in his elbow, wrist, and well, most of his right arm. Hopefully you get to feeling better. We'll see you soon, Walter. And coming up, began with our tech news. Take it to you, Gan. Well, as Ian alluded, um, Apple decided for their next version of their iPhone, the iPhone 7, they're removing the headphone jack. Which is interesting. Initially when I heard that, I thought, oh yeah, that'd be great. That means they can finally make a slimmer phone. Then I saw a side-by-side -side picture with the 6, and... It's exactly the same thickness. So, I have no idea why they're doing it, aside from to shill their 170-ish dollar earbuds, which I look forward to finding them on the ground, as headphones, earbuds, have a habit of just falling out. At least for me. Also, the uh, idea of having no headphone jack isn't completely unheard of in the tech world. As many of you, well, our older viewers at this point, may remember, the Game Boy Advance SP did not have a headphone jack either. And Nintendo, being smart with the next iteration, the Game Boy Micro and the DS, the original model DS, put a headphone jack back on there where it has remained ever since. Also in Nintendo news, um, they showed up at the Apple Keynote press conference to announce a new Mario game. It's a Super Mario Bros. Endless Runner, solely for the iPhone. I'm assuming an Android version will come later, but for now, it is an iPhone exclusive. When I heard Super Mario game as an iPhone exclusive, my first thought was, am I going to have to go buy an iPhone now? Then I heard it was an Endless Runner, and... Any amount of caring went right out the window. Other than that, um, there is supposedly an update to Pokemon Go that lets you have a buddy Pokemon. You can select one of your Pokemon. It will be by your side, go on adventures, and more likely walk around the block. And it will accrue Pokemon candies, which, for some things, it might help you get that Gyarados faster or... Evolve your Dratini into a Dragonair. It's mostly useful for Pokemon that you don't see around very often. AKA things that aren't Pidgey, Rattata, and more Pidgeys. And as I said, that update has not come through on my phone, despite being released about four days ago. In continuing game news, Sony announced the PlayStation 4 Pro, as well as the PlayStation 4 Slim. The Slim will be 300, the Pro will be 400, and the big thing with the, the Pro is that it will have 4K HD output for games, not movies, unless they're streamed. It does not have support for 4K Blu-rays, which is something that the Xbox One Slim will have. So that seems an interesting thing, as the Blu-ray was the main selling point of the original PlayStation 3 to not have the latest and greatest Blu-ray hard drive hardware in there. 
And one more thing on the subject of the PlayStation 4, Slim, and Pro. They're also redesigning the camera, which... Hello to the other three people who own the PlayStation 4 camera. This one's round, as the other one is square. It doesn't seem to have any other differences, other than they're trying to streamline it for support of their VR helmet. The other thing is a redesign of the DualShock 4. The redesigned DualShock 4 has, if I'm understanding correctly, two lights. One, like it normally has, the colorful light that faces the television so that the camera can detect who is where, but this time it is smaller and likely less battery draining, and a smaller one that is near the top of the controller to show you what color it is without having to turn the controller upside down. And one more, one more last thing. Last weekend, Overwatch was free to play on consoles. And, well, the first two days I tried to play it, I was kicked out of every match. It just could not find enough players despite being a free weekend. I'm not sure how that bodes for the actual game, and at this point I'm not sure if I want to dish out $60 to pay for a game that may not have enough players, even on a free weekend. Wonderful reporting, Gan. Thank you very much. Now... We're already halfway through September, which means October's around the corner, and that means you need to start stocking up on your horror films for when you do those solo marathons throughout Hollow's Eve and Halloween. Some that have been recommended, aside from the classic Universal collection of Dracula, Frankenstein, Creature from the Black Lagoon, and so on, is actually Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which had Robert De Niro star in it, surprisingly. Another, if you don't feel too traditional with your vampires and know that they aren't covered in glitter, but still want that interesting vibe about them, it'd be more recommended to try the original Lost Boys. Avoid the last two, though. The original Lost Boys, directed by Joel Schumacher, and introducing Bill of Bill and Ted fame, as well as a few others that would go on to become very successful actors in their own right. And in LEGO news, because LEGO is one of my passions, LEGO Dimensions has a free update coming at the end of this month, that is to say, September 27th. It'll add in support for all the new characters, many of which are from 80s properties like E.T. and Gremlin and Mr. T. The list goes on, but the ones I personally have pre-ordered are the Adventure Time Level Pack and the Harry Potter Team Pack. And I'm really looking forward to having E.T. interact with Gizmo from Gremlins. In continuing LEGO news, a few things that they announced and released in the past week or so. The Disney Castle set, which is very tall, contains several thousand pieces, and retails for $350, has gone over very well with the LEGO community and has been pretty much sold out on the website since its release, even at that hefty price point. That price point isn't nearly as hefty as the new redesigned Death Star, which clocks in at $499, despite only having a few hundred pieces more than the previous iteration that lasted for eight years, which is an unprecedented shelf life for a LEGO set. A lot of people are not happy with this, however, as the Death Star Lego set is a playset. It, while it has a lot of scenes making up the sphere of the Death Star, it does not have plates to cover the outside of the Death Star, so it does not look all that great as a display piece. People were hoping more for something like the mid-2000s Death Star 2 set, or maybe one updated based on the planet-sized Death Star equivalent from The Force Awakens being a more recent movie. The Mixels line is being discontinued this year after the next wave. Despite selling well the entire time, I think LEGO is just looking to move on. Although after the last wave, which included, like, monstrous dental equipment, 
I think it might be about time to retire. I think they have f gone full creepypasta on us. And I'm just enjoying the thought that little Billy, after going to the dentist, is given this big toothed dental chair monster. And then he never wants to go back, and his mom can't quite figure out why, and I am just laughing on the inside because of that. One last thing, Lego. The Ninjago movie, which I was not very interested in before, apparently has Jackie Chan playing Master Wu, and I am immensely more excited for this than I was. Also, it's done by the same team as the Lego movie, so it should be at least that caliber of writing and background zaniness. And to close off our show, I'm going to go back to Ian with wrestling news. Thank you again, Gan. Excellent reporting. I'm actually kind of excited for some of that as well. I'd love to do a follow-up on that. But in the world of wrestling, the wrestling world was actually shocked by the debut match of CM Punk within an octagon? Yes, that's right. CM Punk's almost two-year journey finally culminated this past Saturday against Mickey Gall in an undercard match for UFC 203. The entire wrestling community was on their feet and at the edge of their seat as Cult of Personality filled the air, which was CM Punk's entrance music in WWE. He got a round of applause, a standing ovation. The crowd was screaming his name before the bell even rang. He seemed very confident heading into the match. He seemed like he belonged there. He did soak in the adulation for a moment, but that's completely understandable for someone transitioning into a new sport, which he actually swore he was going to devote full time to. Not part time, not a one time thing to get it out of his system. However, the match itself. Not as glorious as he had hoped. It was not a knockdown drag out of fair as long as he had expected. It certainly wasn't a grappling contest. It went about a minute and a half, almost a minute 45, when Mickey Gall practically charged him as they went for it in the center of the cage. But when CM Punk showed he was going to sh do some excellent stand up game, Mickey had to switch gears and go for grappling, which either Punk was. I'm prepared for or just didn't have a chance to respond properly whether it was his timing or such Mickey did in inadvertently take him down to the ground twice and pummel him breaking his nose in the process and actually cutting his right ear near the back due to a few hammer fist punches however the match wasn't stopped by just a mere pummeling punk did try to fight out of this several times but in the end he was beaten with a rear naked choke forcing Punk to tap. However, no one has shown him any actual disrespect since this. I mean, it's your debut match in the UFC. There had to be some butterflies, but let's not forget that Brock Lesnar himself, yes, the Beast Incarnate, lost his first UFC match. And he went on to become a champion. Can Punk do the same thing at a surprisingly svelte 170 division? Or should he drop a little more weight or go up a few pounds and see where his luck takes him then? Speaking of debuts, ladies and gentlemen, Lucha Underground Season 3, as it's been advertised, started this past Wednesday. And it debuted with none other than Mentanza Cueto, the Lucha Underground Champion, defending his belt against Son of Havoc in a very back-and-forth match with Son of Havoc bringing the attack again and again, resorting to high-risk moves off the top rope that continuously put the monster down. His older brother, Dario Cueto, was at ringside and looked a little panicked. But in the end, the monster Montanza did indeed win his belt and defend it properly for the Lucha Temple. That was just the first match. Then we had a ladies' match between Taya of Johnny Mundo's new stable take on Sexy Star for her Gift of the Gods championship, which was very back and forth with Johnny Mundo, PJ Black, 
and a few others coming to ringside, hopefully, to turn the tables and tie his favor. But Sexy Star did end up successfully defending her belt and shocking the world by once again going up against the numbers and coming out on top. But the main event of the evening was quite the battle. When Pentagon Dark faced Rey Mysterio to cement his name in the legacy of Lucha Underground, which has already racked up numerous victories and shocking moments. As Pentagon Dark has broken numerous arms in the past, retired Prince Puma, and even resurrected the legend of Vampiro, one of the commentators who has a deathmatch background and was revealed to be the original Maestre, I hope I said that right, or Master Sensei, if you will, of Pentagon Dark when he came into the Lucha Temple. However, he was not successful against Rey Mysterio, who showed that he still has it and looked physically impressive beyond all else. With a more lean build, but still his old lucha size from back in his days at ECW and WCW, but with the muscle cut that you would have seen him in when he was fighting in WWE. Now, Pentagon Dark did not take this victory as humbly or sportsmanlike as you would think, and began to attempt to break the arm of even Rey Mysterio, but in the end he was saved by the returning Dragon Azteca Junior. And that's just the first episode, folks. Who knows what's going to happen with Lucha Underground. But aside from those exciting moments in Lucha, we transfer to Thursday evening on Impact with the one story everyone's still talking about. The show itself was entertaining. You did have some good matches, but everyone wants to know about Delete or Decay. When the stable known as Delete as has been slipped about on certain forums of Broken Matt Hardy, his wife, Rebby Sky, and of course the obsolete mule, now known as Brother Nero, held off the Hardy compound from the attack of the group known as Decay, run by Rosemary, the Muscle, the Monster, Abyss, and of course, Crazy Steve, who may or may not be the Joker to Rosemary's Harley. Unlike the original encounter at the Hardy compound, also known as the Final Deletion, where Brother Nero and Brother Matt battled all over for Matt to become successful in owning the Hardy brand and almost brainwashing his brother in the process through the insane stunts and actions brought upon one another with now Brother Hero almost committing suicide trying to take out his brother from a 20-foot drop into an open grave. Fast forward several months to them now mending ways and facing the new threat of decay that have come to apparently abduct King Maxwell, Matt Hardy's child, at the Hardy compound. And even with the assistance of Senior Benjamin, it was a very back and forth, almost from what the footage showed, a stalemate, as neither side truly won but truly lost. With even Chris Park, Abyss's own brother, being summoned up from the lake, that magical hearty lake, to distract Senior Benjamin for a moment. Truly stunning things. And Jeff Hardy almost killing Crazy Steve within the pool, drowning him, and almost breaking his larynx. Rosemary battled Rebby Sky, but for some reason Vanguard 1 and the other security cameras weren't able to catch a lot of footage. So all we know is Rosemary entered, and Rosemary left of her own, holding King Maxwell for a moment. Rebby Sky was able to get to her feet, but Lord knows what she actually was put through during the match. Abyss 
meanwhile, buried his thumbtack bat, no, not thumbtack bat, but his two-by-four known as Janus. A board with nails in it, people. I mean, that's about as primitive as it's going to get. He buried that in Brother Nero's midsection. Hopefully he did survive, but no one's sure for now. We'll find out this Thursday. As for the abduction of King Maxwell, it was thwarted by his own father, Matthew Hardy, by absorbing and swallowing a green mist, a, a mucus-like thing that Rosemary spat upon him, that he absorbed and spat back at her in a truly maddening, if not broken, fashion. It is one of those things that brings wrestling to a whole new medium. We're not quite sure if by doing this they're attempting to compete with certain rivals like Robert Rodriguez's Lucha Underground, which is a more cinematic approach that still shows live-action Lucha wrestling, or if this is just the Hardys at their most eccentric, if not overly artistic. Being a pro myself, I haven't had any scenarios like that come up, but I do get four-star matches, people. Once again, folks, those were the tidbits that you idiots missed from the week of September 4th through September 11th, 2016. I'm Ian the Torch Torchetti. And I'm Gan. That's what, what you idiots, idiots missed. And if I could afford those Lego sets, that giant Disney castle or that $500 Death Star. Maybe we could afford a better camera. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs>